Hello, everybody. How you doing? Hope everyone is doing well. Um, let's get right to today's class. A uh, reminder that your questions about essay three are due today. Um, yeah, they're due now. <laughs> so if you haven't gotten them in, please do so uh, immediately. And um, your thesis, your working thesis, is due on Friday. Um, I have a couple of questions that people have already sent in. I'm going to answer those uh, in a few minutes. But let's get right to the um, introductions that um, I ask you to uh, look for in the Times. OK, the um, first one, um, I had two people um, choose the introduction from the article titled Mental Health in the Age of the Coronavirus. And I'm just going to pull that up if I can. Um, and here it is. Um, and this is the, this is the, um, this is the introduction. Would you do us a favor? Would you be willing to describe how the coronavirus is affecting your mental health? Is the combination of isolation and existential stress making you feel more depressed and anxious? Or is the family togetherness and the pause from normal life giving you a greater sense of belonging and equilibrium? How would you describe your psychological state? What are you doing to cope? If you're a mental health worker, what are you seeing out there? Okay, so this author used a, a bunch of questions, which uh, was interesting because uh, I had one person write, I found this introduction to be effective because I really like when an article gives you questions to think about as you read, especially when they are open-ended questions that are specific to whoever is reading them, meaning that the questions don't have a right or wrong answer. Another person wrote, um, the introduction appears to me to be effective due to the fact that it started out with asking questions about mental health, such as, would you be willing to describe how the coronavirus is affecting your mental health? Instead of just spewing facts and going on tangents, asking the audience questions creates, uh, causes the reader to feel more engaged with the article, making them want to continue reading. I find this the most effective way of introducing an article because questioning the reader makes it seem more personal, personal and relatable. Um, again, very interesting that, that this essay was even in the Times and interesting the two people even chose it because this is an issue that comes up a lot with student essays. Should, should, they, should you open your essay with a question. Should you use questions as an introduction and how do they work and do they even work? Generally speaking, when I see students use questioning as a way of answering, uh, uh, opening an essay, it's not working because of the way they're asking the question. Often I will see uh, students uh, open an essay with, um, have you ever gone on a vacation and had that vacation go completely wrong? Um, or um, have you ever um, uh, tried out a new meal and found that you really liked it? The problem with, with opening essays with questions like these is that for many, if not most readers, the answer will be, nope. And then where are you? You know? Unless you've done something to heighten the reader's curiosity about those questions and those topics, it's not an effective introduction. And asking um, the reader those kinds of questions tells the reader that this is what I'm going to write about. I'm asking you about these things but I'm not really interested in your, uh, in, in, in your answers. What I'm obviously about to do is to tell you my answers, okay? So not only does it not grab the reader's attention, but it kind of signals to the reader that, you know, I'm asking you these questions, but obviously you can't answer me. I'm giving you my uh, 
information. Um, so asking the reader about their information on those topics is really a waste of time. The reason it works in this article is because the very next pair, well, first of all, the, uh, the, the questions are, as one of the readers mentioned, very open-ended. Um, they are, um, uh, they're specific, they're open-ending, they're, most of them are not, well, I guess some of them are yes or no questions, but they are very specific. Is the combination of isolation and existential stress making you feel more depressed and anxious? There are many readers that are going, going to go, yes, it absolutely is. Or is the family togetherness and the pause from normal life giving you a greater sense of belonging and equilibrium? Well, hopefully there are a lot of uh, readers who might say yes. How would you describe your psychological state? What are you doing to cope? Um, these questions also have the advantage of being on our minds right now, 24-7. Unlike the questions I used as examples, um, usually when students try to open their essays with questions, they're asking questions that are just coming out of the blue, things that are not even remotely on your reader's mind, whereas these questions are on our, our minds right now around the clock. So it's a very particular set of circumstances and a very particular set of questions that this author is asking. And then the next um, paragraph, uh, the writer writes, if you're willing to share, please fill out the form at the end of this column. The Times may publish some responses online, and I'll write another column reporting on what you say. I ask for a couple of reasons. This is a moment that calls for deeper conversations and emotional accompaniment. So, these questions are effective. They are soliciting responses from the readers. They are very specific and they um, are questions that are on our minds right now. So in this case, questions as the opening to uh, an essay are working. But as you can see, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to thread that needle, to ask questions that are, are um, uh, good, that make a good introduction. So uh, if your question, and then many students ask me this question, can I open my introduction with a question? The answer is yes, but it's tricky. So it's something that um, I would generally try to avoid, okay? Um, if you wanna try it in your draft, you know, go ahead. And, you know, you are certainly welcome to show me your introduction and say, these are the questions that I've used. Are they, are they working? And I'd be, you know, more than happy to talk to you about them. Um, okay, so the next three responses I got, and I'm reading, by the way, if I, if you don't hear me read your response, it doesn't mean that I didn't get it. It just means that I had to kind of whittle them down for time. Um, here is a student who responded. Um, I chose the article, Google searches can help us find emerging COVID-19 outbreaks. I think his introduction is very short and direct. He goes straight to the point uh, he's trying to make and his thesis. For me, this technique is different I was learned uh, to come in with a hook or something to catch the reader, then tell them the point of my essay. Let's take a look uh, very quickly at the um, um, introduction of this article. Okay. Every day, millions of people around the world type their health symptoms into Google. We can use these searches to help detect unknown COVID-19 outbreaks, particular, particularly in parts of the world with poor testing infrastructure. Like, like this student said, straight into the point. Um, this next person said, the article, Brace Yourself for Waves of Coronavirus Infections, had an effective introduction, although it was only one sentence. 
The introduction is straight to the point and it leaves the reader with questions. The introduction to this essay is, in the world war against the coronavirus, there's both very good news and very bad news. That's a really interesting opening uh, and it is straight to the point and it gets us interested because when we hear that rhetorical device used in our everyday lives, if you came to me and you said, uh, you know, Mr. Rusco, how's my grade looking? And I said, well, we've got good news and we've got bad news. You would, you would be like, tell me, tell me both of them now, you know? So using that device is, is, is a good introduction. It's direct, it's due the po to the point, and it makes us want the author to tell us both the good news and the bad news as quickly as possible. Um, and then another person wrote that the article uh, wrote about an article titled, When Will Social Distancing Let Up? The introduction here says, on Sunday, President Trump heeded the warnings of public health officials and walked back his plan to lift social distancing guidelines by Easter. Instead, all Americans have been instructed to continue to avoid non-essential travel going to work, drinking, and eating at bars and restaurants, or gathering in groups of more than 10 for another month, perhaps even longer. But how much longer? Here are a few timelines that public health experts and journalists have proposed for when and how we might start to regain at least some semblance of norm normalcy. A good introduction. Um, it gives you a little bit of uh, uh, background that, that President Trump had said he wanted the country to be running again by Easter. He walked back those plans and, and said, now it's going to go another month and perhaps longer, but for how much longer? Here are some timelines that people have proposed. Well, geez, in the position we're all in, how can we not go on and read that article? Um, this student said, the introduction is short and cuts to the chase by setting up his next talking points, how things will progress in the future. So we have three students here who liked introductions because they were short. This one said, uh, it cuts to the chase. You all may be familiar with that uh, phrase. By the way, uh, the term cut to the chase comes from the movies. Back in the old silent era of movies, there was a director named uh, Max Sennett, and every one of his short uh, um, black and white silent comedy films ended with a chase, usually a car chase. And it was very silly, and it started a group called the Keystone Cops, who were a bunch of policemen who were very goofy and silly. And um, Sennett's idea of motion pictures were, everything in a motion picture is an excuse to get to the chase at the end of the movie because that's what the audience is, wait, is waiting for. So when he was editing a movie and he didn't know what else to do, he would tell the editor, look, cut to the chase. Cut from wherever you are and just go to the chase. That's where the term cut to the chase comes from. We now know it to mean that when somebody's running their mouths, we might tell them, look, cut to the chase. Just make your meaning, make your point. So we have three students here who say that they like these introductions because they are short and they cut to the chase. Um, one of the students asked, uh, is it good to do the same with my essay? Is this also another way to write a thesis um, or, or an introduction rather? The answer is yes. You don't have to write a long, elaborate introduction, again, that starts out really wide and then takes its time narrowing its way down to the thesis. Um, again, I would use the example of the way many students I, I've seen over the years write an introduction. You know, if I was going to have you write about the coronavirus, you know, some students may sit down and write, there are many problems in the world today. We struggle with problems such as poverty and hunger and climate control. The, 
The planet is dying around us and people are going hungry. But one problem we're facing today is the coronavirus. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, cut to the chase. Okay? You don't have to warm up. I don't need to hear the orchestra warming up in order for me to hear the symphony performance. All right? So these three students picked out introductions that were short, direct, to the point, and cut to the chase. So again, when you're drafting a paper, it doesn't matter. Write whatever gets you writing, all right? But when you go back to revise your essay, write an introduction that is short and direct and cuts to the chase. That's never a bad idea. That is never a bad idea, which we will see when we start talking about sentences and about how every sentence and every word needs to be pulling its weight. You should always be direct and concise and always get to your point because a good principle of writing is that we don't want to make our readers read more than they have to in order to understand us. We should be concise enough so that they are always getting the point, all right? So whether it's, whether it's stating our thesis or whether it's supporting our thesis, as we're supporting our thesis and we are unveiling our argument to support our thesis and we are going point by point by point, we are being as concise as possible. Even when we're developing those points in depth, we are always being clear and concise and making our points exactly instead of wandering away from the, the topic, all right? Um, the, next, um, the next article that was chosen was titled, Why a Digital Diary Will Change Your Life. And this is what the person wrote. Last summer in a kitschy hotel in the Pacific Northwest, I spotted a sort of funny lampshade. Naturally, I snapped a picture. At first, my plan was to do what I always do when seeing something halfway noteworthy, which is to tell a few hundred thousand people on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or in my lower moments, even LinkedIn. Smartphones and social networks have turned me into a lonely, needy man who requires constant affirmation. In desperate pursuit of such affirmation, my mind has come to resemble one of those stamping machine assembly lines you see in cartoons, but for shareable content. The raw analog world in all its glory enters via con conveyor belt on one end, and after some raucous puffs of smoke, it gets flattened and packaged in my head into insipid quips meant to inspire you to tap a tiny heart on a screen. For this lampshade picture, the quip came to me instantly. That deer has a lot more on his mind than the majestic view. Sure, my caption was silly, puerile, entirely unbecoming of a New York Times columnist. That was also why it might have been glorious. Dumb, somewhat edgy dad jokes fit snugly within the vernacular of my long cultivated Twitter persona. And I could imagine this one getting 100 plus likes easy. Okay, I read a lot of that. And in fact, I read a little farther than that introduction. Um, the reason this student liked it was um, anything dealing with social media usually catches my attention because it's part of my daily life uh, and I developed a strong opinion on it. The introduction was describing the author's train of thought of why or why not he should post a picture with a caption on social media. So this article, this introduction is doing two things. One, it's, it's telling a story. Remember, he's, we talked about when we could all be together, um, uh, narrative. It's telling a story with which this student identified, allowing the student to identify with what he's doing. Because this author knows that, geez, most of his audience probably does the same thing all the time. I mean, who among us does not take pictures and slap them up on social media and say something about them for all the world to see? So we identify with that author in that introduction. That makes us want to read more. 
Um, the other thing that introduction does, which I've talked about before, is that it sets the tone of the article, all right? First of all, from the first picture, uh, the first sentence rather, we know that he's telling a story, it's in the first person, so it's a story about himself, and we see that he's, he's making fun of himself. He's, um, you know, he, he's, he's having f some fun with himself. He's, he calls the caption silly, puerile, which you can look up if you want to, entirely unbecoming of a New York Times columnist, that it was a dumb, somewhat edgy dad joke. So, you know, he's, he's making fun of what he puts up on social media. So we see the tone, we see the, the, that it's a story, we see what form it's taking, we see the tone in that it is self-deprecating, he's making fun of himself, we see the level of language using things like, uh, using words like uh, puerile, unbecoming, um, uh, he's a man, he is a lonely, needy man who requires constant affirmation, so we see the level of language that he's using, so by the time we finish that introduction, we know all of those things about what the article is going to be. That's our taste of the article, you see? So again, that's something that you want to do in an essay. You want to um, um, reveal the, to the general subject, the specific topic, your thesis, and the tone of the uh, essay and the level of language that you're going to use. In school, for academic papers, your tone and language is going to be roughly the same for all your papers. You want to maintain a serious academic tone in what you write. You want to maintain a, a, a level of vocabulary that's suitable for an academic paper. But maybe not always, all right? So, Again, that's what a good introduction uh, does. Let me pause here and give you your attendance question. This one might be very easy for some of you. You might get this without having to Google it. I would like you to email me the name of our, of the name of the minor league baseball team located in Hartford, Connecticut. There is a minor league baseball team that plays its games in Hartford, Connecticut. Email me their name. That's all you got to do. Some of you may know it. If you don't, it should be easy to Google. Email it me. Email it to me at the usual usual address, mrusco English one twelve at gmail.com. The name of Hartford's minor league baseball team. Okay. Moving on. I had two people um, say that they liked an article titled, What We Pretend to Know About the Coronavirus Could Kill Us. Let me read you that introduction. Um, okay. Other than a vaccine or an extra 500,000 ventilators, tests and hospitals, I'm sorry, let me start again. Other than a vaccine or an extra 500,000 ventilators, tests and hospital beds, Reliable information is the best weapon we have against COVID-19. It allows us to act uniformly and decisively to flatten the curve. In an ideal pandemic scenario, sound information is produced by experts and travels quickly to the public. But we seem to be living in a nightmare scenario. The coronavirus emerged in the middle of a golden age for media manipulation and it is stealthy, resilient, and confounding to experts. It moves far faster than, fa faster than scientists can study it. What seems to be true today may be wrong tomorrow. Uncertainty abounds, and an array of dangerous misinformation, disinformation, and flawed amateur analysis fills the void. So again, a nice introduction because it uh, tells us this is what we need these good things are what we need to beat coronavirus. But there's a bad thing going around that helps promote it, which is misinformation. And so now, you know, readers, as a reader, you'd want to know more about that. One student wrote, 
The introduction managed to capture my attention because of how quick it gets to the point about the article and how succinct it was in describing the problem with how the media influences the pandemic about the virus. Um, again, um, it gets how quickly it gets to the point about the article. So it makes its point most quickly by comparing, you know, misinformation about the coronavirus is a bad thing. And he compares it to the good thing that we need to fight the virus itself. It's a nice way to start it. I, uh, I had to pick out this, this one because this made me laugh out loud. Um, I chose to read what we pretend to know about the coronavirus could kill us, mainly because I have been seeing a lot of fake misleading and confusing news that have been distributed as facts. My father, who is in the healthcare industry, really believed that the virus could be killed by sticking a hairdryer up your nose. I hadn't heard that. My sister tried to show me a video of a woman saying that the virus couldn't be spread by animals, yet that's how the virus started. Um, the sentence that made me keep reading was, in an ideal pandemic scenario, sound information is produced by experts and travels quickly to the public, but we seem to be living in a nightmare scenario. It got me interested because I wanted to know more about how bad the spread of false or misleading news was. So there you go. It was an effective introduction, made this student reader want to know more about how bad the spread of misleading news was. Um, if we have not personally encountered misleading or false news about the coronavirus, we have all certainly encountered misleading or false news about any number of topics. You know, I see people putting up stuff all the time on social media, which makes you think, wait, that, that can't be right. And you look it up on Snopes and you find out it's not true. Or someone will put it up there and in the responses is a link to the Snopes article telling you that it's not true. Um, in case you're not familiar with Snopes, it's S-N-O-P-E-S, Snopes.com will give you, you know, the facts about if you hear a story that doesn't quite sound true, that's where you can um, check it out. Um, the last one I wanted to uh, read, and I know this video is a little longer than the other ones, bear with me, we'll be soon, uh, we'll be done very soon. Um, this article is titled, This is what happens when a narcissist runs a crisis. And here's the introduction. Since the early days of the Trump administration, an impassioned group of medical health professionals have warned the public about the president's cramped and disordered mind, a darkened addict of fluttering bats. Their assessments have been controversial. The American Psych Psychiatric Association's Code of Ethics expressly forbids its member from diagnosing a public figure from afar. Enough is enough. As I've argued before, an in-person analysis of Donald J. Trump would not reveal any hidden depths. His internal sonar could barely fathom the bottom of a sink. And these are ex uh, exceptionally urgent times. Um, so an effective introduction, um, the image of a darkened addict full of fluttering bats to describe the president's cramped and disordered mind. Um, I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but it's, an, it's a very effective use of language. Um, and it's a very effective, would this be a metaphor? I think it's a metaphor. Remember, we, I, I, I forgot what a metaphor in a, in a simile was in class one day. I think this is a metaphor of her comparing the president's mind to a darkened addict of fluttering bats. If it's a simile, please write in and tell me that I got it wrong again, by all means. Um, um, this person wrote, right off the top, the title intrigued me because I knew it was about Trump and how he deals with, with the pandemic. I like how they started off the introduction talking about how mental health professionals warn the public about Trump's cramped and disordered mind, as they call it in the article. That was something I didn't know, and they're also catching the reader's attention by mentioning something like that. Uh, this this uh, student also goes on to write, 
I didn't know that people consider Trump to have a personality disorder. I just thought he was a jerk. Um, again, it's not my job to tell you what to think of the president. However, I will point out it is possible that he is both. Um, anyway, the fact that this, this author went into talking about um, a psychiatric disorder with a president running our response to a pandemic is, is a good way to start an article. It's, it's an interesting uh, um, thesis. Again, you, you don't have to, you can, you can very much disagree with it, but you can still recognize it as a good piece of writing. If something is written well, doesn't mean you have to agree with it. We can just recognize things that the, uh, we can recognize things that the author did to, to effectively convey his thesis. Because as a reader, it's possible for us to say, you know, I understand your thesis. I don't agree with it, but I get what you're trying to say, All right? If you've had, um, if you've had discussions with friends, family, anyone who you disagree with, you know what it's like to say, I get what you're saying, but I disagree with it, All right? If you get what the author's saying, then the author has done his or her job, okay? Um, all right, I want to address um, a few of you sent in questions, um, and I want to address uh, I want to address these questions now. Uh, three of you sent in questions early. I want to address these questions now so that you can use them to write your thesis. Um, one person wrote, um, uh, for this essay, are we allowed to talk in the first person and the third person? Yes. Uh, many teachers tell you, do not write in the first person. Do not use the word I in your essay. Again, this does not mean that that is a rule for every essay you ever write. This means that that audience specifically does not want you to do that. A good principle of good writing is that you write for your audience. You write in a way that your audience will understand best. And you write in a way uh, that will convey your thesis to that audience most effectively. If the teacher tells you not to do that, don't do it. It's as simple as that, because that teacher is your audience. You don't wanna make them mad. Don't use I, okay? If you have a teacher that tells you it's okay, then it's okay. It's a tool that you can use, all right? Um, okay, another student writes, I'm a little confused on how to answer what you are asking when reading this article. Are we supposed to be talking about what life is going to be like or what we need to do to make things back to normal? Um, the answer is neither one of those things. In all, I'm just lost comparing the article to the questions being asked. Okay, for this assignment, for the SA3 assignment, um, I am not asking you to address exactly the same issue that the author in the article is um, addressing. I am not asking you to write about the thesis that the author has. I'm asking you to respond to the article. It's a very different thing, all right? So what you need to do is read this article in which um, the author talks about um, the emergency, the post-emergency time, and this middle weird um, period of getting from the emergency to back to normal, all right? And then I want you to write about what will be the most difficult part of that middle period? What will be the most difficult part of returning to that sense of normal? Um, as the assignment asks, what ways has the crisis affected us that will make it hardest to go through that middle period as we shift from a constant state of emergency back to our everyday lives? What specific areas will be the most difficult challenges as we go through this process? Um, so here's what I'm asking. 
the article that you're reading defines three different periods, emergency, normal, and the transitional period between the emergency and normal. What I'm asking you to write about is what will be the most difficult parts of going through that middle period, all right? Um, and I gave you some suggestions that you can use if you like. Will it be most difficult on us psychologically, socially, emotionally, politically? Will it be a combination of those elements? Will it be something else completely, all right? So what I'm asking is, as we as a country move from the emergency part of the crisis to back to normal, as we go through that weird middle period, as we're transitioning from emergency to normal, and the author describes that middle period in the article, what do you think will be the most difficult uh, challenges that we face as we go through that middle part, All right? Um, if you have any more, uh, the, the student who asked me that question, if you have any more questions about it, uh, please go ahead and email me and we'll discuss it. Um, another student wrote, do you have an idea of when SA3 draft will be due? I don't have an exact date picked yet um, uh, because we also have a day off, um, I believe a week from Friday, we have what is on the Southern calendar, a day of reflection. So I will not be posting a video that day, that will be a day off. Um, generally, once the working thesis is done, um, I, I try to give you a week to write a draft and a week to write the revision. That's general, generally what I try to do, so that's, that might give you a general idea. Um, oh, and that's it. Those are all three questions that, uh, that you asked. And we are, um, we are done. So again, I know this video was a little longer. I apologize, but there was just a lot to get to. Um, your attendance question, email it to that address. If you have other um, uh, questions outside of that homework assignment question I gave you, um, you can email me at that address. Um, you're always welcome to Skype with me, to talk with me on the phone. I have, I've already talked to a few students on the phone. I have a Skype appointment set up tomorrow. So please, I, I'm um, more than happy to talk to you and, and meet with you about your specific uh, questions and problems. And, um, you know, frankly, at this point, just seeing a friendly face is, uh, um, you know, that's not bad either. Okay, excellent. We're done for today. Um, I will be back on YouTube on Friday, and um, I will talk to you then, All right? Take care. Bye-bye. Stay well.